Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Today I'm going to write a class that represents a texture resource in the low-level render engine. We can use this class to read from texture data while rendering objects. In addition, we can also use it to create textures that can be written to by the graphics pipeline. For example, we can use it to create render targets and depth stencil textures, which we are going to write in the next video. Before we write any new code, I'd like to do a couple of improvements and bug fixes for the classes that we wrote in the last couple of episodes. There is a tiny fix that I need to do in FreeList, and that's the typo that I made when I was copying and pasting these functions. And as you can see here, the empty method needs to return a boolean. And that's the only thing that I needed to change here, so I can go ahead and close this. The next one is in vector where I forgot to put a line in the resize function that makes it not work properly when the new size is less than the actual size of the vector. If I would open the implementation of the struct range, you can see that it doesn't change the value of size. And whether we do this or not, depending on the value of the struct, we always need to set a new value for the member variable size, of course. So here, I need to type in size equals new size and do this for the other overload of resize as well. Next, I could think of a small improvement in M place back. In this function, I'm using placement new to create a new instance of whatever it is we are trying to put at the end of the array and then increase the size of the collection and return a reference to that newly created element. But of course, we know that new returns a pointer, right? So we can already put the reference that we want to return in a new variable and then return that item instead. It's not a huge improvement, but it just eliminates one instruction. In the last episode, I also asked two questions when I was implementing the swap function here. And the first one was whether we can swap two vectors for which this destruct template argument is different. So for one of them, it is set to true and the other has it set to false. And the answer of course is no, because we can assign two different types that are not implicitly convertible to each other. And the second question was, why is this implementation of swap so bad? And that's of course not really a difficult question. If you think about it for a couple of seconds, everyone can see that we are having a reference of the other factor here. And when we are creating a temporary, it just creates a copy of the other vector. And that means that we have two collections of items that are copies of each other. So that's really slow. And adding insult to injury, we are assigning this vector to the other vector, which uses the copy assignment operator here. And that means that we are making another copy of this vector, again, a second copy. And the third time that we copy all the items is when we assign the temporary vector here to this vector which really defeats the purpose of existence of this swap function, of course. And what we can do to fix that problem is use the move version of everything that we do here. So when we want to create a temporary here, I want to make this use the move constructor for this vector. And I can do that by typing in standard move. In the same way, I could make the compiler use the move assignment operator instead of copy assignment operator by using standard move here as well. And the same goes for the final line in this function. But we can do even better because even though this works just fine, that means that it's going to call the move assignment operator, which does more than we need to do for this specific case. If we look at the move assignment operator for the vector, we can see that it does this if check first, and then it tries to destroy whatever it is already in this vector and then move the other one into this one. 
But in the swap function, we already moved the other vector into a temporary, and that move operation will already destroy its contents. So we don't need to do it again, right? And therefore, we don't need to use this copy assignment operator. We can just use the move function to move this vector to the other vector. Likewise, we can use this vector's move function to move the temporary vector into this one. And this makes the swap function as efficient as it can be. The last improvement with regards to the containers is in the utilities header when we have these utility functions to call the erase unordered function from the vector class. And in both cases, when we use the STL vector or our own vector, it expects a vector type to be passed in. And the problem now is that, first of all, it only accepts a vector. And second of all, it accepts a vector where the destruct parameter is set to true. So if we had a vector where that destruct parameter is set to false, then it wouldn't be accepted by this function. And to solve this problem, we just remove the type of vector. Because if we are having a template function anyway, we can just assume that the type that we are giving it is including the type of vector. So any class that has a function called erase unordered can be used with this template function, which makes it the more powerful. And we can also do the same with the other one that we use for STL vector. And then we can close these files. And the next change that I would like to do is something in the 3D12 class. And although everything here functions correctly, I would like to remove the dependency of frame buffer count because that implies that somehow the frame buffer count that we chose for our renderer has to be the same as the number of back buffers that we have in swap chain. And that's of course not true. We can have any number of frames and any number of back buffers for our swap chains. And this happens to be three right now, and that's fine, but I wouldn't like to use the same variable to set this anymore. And what I'd like to do is just to have a constant here in this class that defines the number of back buffers for me. And that means that I need to remove all references to frame buffer count and replace them with buffer count. And that's it. We are now ready to start writing new code. Now I'm going to close all files. And in resources, where we have this descriptor heap class, I can add new resource classes that we will be using for the low level render. And the next class that I'd like to write is a class that represents and encapsulates a texture resource for the D3D12 engine. The texture has two pieces of data. First, we have a pointer to an ID3D12 resource interface. This is a pointer that we get when we upload or create the actual texture using D3D12 API. Next, I add a descriptor handle that will point to the shader resource view for this texture. We will need it for pretty much every texture since they need to be accessible as shader resources during rendering. Using this default constructor, we can create a default instance of this D3D12 texture, which just has a null pointer and an invalid descriptor handle. But of course, things get more interesting when we really initialize this class with some valid data. And therefore, we need another constructor that takes in some initialization information. And I'll define this texture initialization information later, right after we define the structure of this class. And because we have a com pointer to a resource here that we need to track and release when we are done with this class, I'm going to disable all copy operations for this class. And what this does is that it makes each instance of this class a unique instance. So there are no shared ownerships of the pointer that is contained within this class. We can, of course, move one instance into each other, but that means that we always have only one pointer to a certain resource. And that way we can just release it whenever this class is destructed. Now, because I deleted the copy operations, I need to define the move operations. 
And that means that I need to write the move constructor and the move assignment operator. Strictly speaking, when we write a move constructor or a move assignment operator, we need to write something like this. But since this resource is just a pointer and the content of a descriptor handle are also just integers, we can get away with copying these values and then resetting the values in the other instance that we are trying to move into this one. So all we do is just call the reset function and that resets the content of the other instance to their default values. Next is the move assignment operator. We have been doing the same things here as we do in the vector class. So there is really nothing new that we are doing here. We just write some boilerplate code that handles moving another instance into this one. In the move function, we copy the internals of the other instance into this one and call the reset on the other instance, which resets the internals to their default values. And that's basically all there is to it. I need to implement the constructor that takes this initialization information and the release function. And here I'll also add some accessor functions that will get us the resource pointer and the descriptor handle here. Okay, now let's go ahead and implement the constructor and the release function. And we do that in the resource CPP file where we already have the implementation for descriptor heap. The release function is really simple. We just free this descriptor handle that we will allocate in the constructor here. And also we defer release the resource that is in this instance. And we use deferred release because this texture might still be referred to in one of the frame buffers that we are working on. So we wait for that to finish before releasing the resource itself. And of course we have a nice automated way of doing this by calling deferred release. If you haven't watched that video, here is the link and you can click on it and watch how it's done in this engine. And the final thing that we need to do is to implement the constructor. Here, in contrast to what I do often, which is writing the full type of an instance, I'm using the auto keyboard because this device function could return a different interface later on. And we don't want to go through all the code and change everywhere that we call this device function, what it returns. So if we would like to return some other interface like device four, for example, we could do that because there is a device four. Of course, I need to change that in the header as well for this to work, but you get the idea. Now there are different ways in which we can create a D3D12 texture. And the first one is the simplest one, which is the case that the user just gives us a pointer to a resource. That's it. That means that we need to define this structure here, the initialization information to contain a pointer to a resource. Now, if that's the case, we just assign this pointer to the member variable resource. And then we go ahead and allocate a descriptor handle and also create a shader resource view and put it in that location. The create shader resource view will create a shader resource view for us, but it needs some extra information here as well. It needs a pointer to the resource for which we are going to create a shader resource view. 
and it needs a CPU descriptor handle, which we luckily have here. So this is a descriptor handle, which contains a CPU descriptor handle. And it also takes an optional parameter that is a shader resource view description. And we can use that to create different views of the same resource. But it also can be a null pointer. And in that case, the properties of the resource will be used to create the resource view. This is also known as the null descriptor initialization. We need to provide a valid description if the texture was created using a typeless format. Otherwise, this function will fail. So we are going to have a pointer in this information structure and that is the shader resource view description pointer. Again, we are going to add that here in this structure. When there is no resource pointer already provided, we'll need to use some other information in order to create the resource ourselves. In Direct3D12, there are three functions that can be used to create a resource. Create committed resource creates both a resource and an implicit heap such that the heap is big enough to contain the entire resource and the resource is mapped to the heap. Create placed resource creates a resource that is placed in a specific already existing heap. And finally, create reserved resource creates a resource that is reserved and not yet mapped to any pages in a heap. The last method's main use case is when we are dealing with resources that are being streamed into the GPU memory. For now, I'm going to support creating resources using the first two methods. In the future, we can add creating reserved resources whenever that functionality is required. Let's look at create committed resource function first. As I mentioned before, this function will create a heap as well as the resource that will be mapped to that heap. Because there are different kinds of heaps in Direct3D, we need to specify which one we would like to use. This texture class represents a texture for rendering and therefore I'm going to use the default heap type and I can do this by filling in the heap description. When filling in the heap properties, only the heap type is relevant in this case, which is of course set to default heap. The other properties can be zero. Now create committed resource function can access this data through a pointer. Next we can set heap flags and we don't set any so we just use heap flag none. The user can also give us a description of the type of resource that they are trying to create and that one is going to be in the description pointer of this initialization information. And therefore I'm going to add yet another member to this one. And this one is also a pointer. So now we have a member in this init info structure for textures. And this function is expecting a D3D12 resource desk, whereas I added a resource desk one. So now it should work. And the next parameter that is needed is the initial resource state. And these are the states that the resource can be in when we are using DirectX 12 for anything, not just rendering, but also for computations and copying resources and video decoding and encoding. And when we are creating a resource, we need to tell this function in which one of these states this resource should be created. And therefore I'm going to add another member variable in the initialization structure that contains that information. Next, we need an optimized clear value. 
or rather a pointer to something that represents an optimized clear value that the graphics adapter can use to clear the texture. So during each frame where we want to write new content to this texture, we can clear it. And when we provide an optimized clear value, when we created that texture, that value will be used and the texture can be cleared faster using that value than any other value. So here I can create a variable that defines a clear value for when we are creating a render target or a depth stencil texture. So if we are creating our texture using this description and we are creating it to be used for a render target or a depth stencil texture, then we will use the clear value that is in the initialization information and otherwise it will be a null pointer. And here when we are calling create committed resource, we can use this clear value pointer. And the last two parameters for this function are used for putting the created resource in the interface pointer. And also we need to check if this function succeeded because it returns an H result. And after this point, we again proceed and check if the resource pointer is valid and then create a shade resource view for this resource. As we discussed earlier, another way of creating a resource is by calling create place resource function, which creates the resource and maps it to an existing heap. And to add this functionality, I'm going to add another pointer here that will point to a heap. Now, if the user provides a valid pointer to a heap, we can check it here in this if statement. And if that's true, we can create a placed resource instead of a committed resource. When we want to create a place resource, we give it a pointer to the heap where this resource will be placed. Also, we need to specify where in the heap the resource will be placed. We can use a 64-bit value as an offset into the heap, and this is also what this function is expecting. However, in our texture init info structure, I'm going to use a data type that holds a bit more information than just an offset. The resource allocation info contains the offsets the alignment and the size of the resource in bytes. And it can be used in different kinds of scenarios, which makes this more useful to have than just an offset. And the rest of parameters are the same as when we are creating a committed resource. One more thing that I would like to do is to take this default heap properties out of this function and put it somewhere that we can use it whenever we need it. Because this default heap properties is going to be needed more often. And instead of typing it every time, I'm going to create a helpers header and cpp file. And in there, we will have these kind of predefined data structures. In this header file and its corresponding CPP file, I'll use a lot of types that will help us fill in frequently used data structures. And to not to pollute the D3D12 namespace or any other namespace, I'm using this D3DX. And I used X because DirectX also has a helper header called D3DX12, which is not part of the SDK, but you have to download it separately. And it has a lot of useful data structures that will help you when you are using the DirectX API. And although it's a real time saver, if you are going to use it, it has the disadvantage of hiding away a lot of details. And because we are learning the API, I would like to write my own helpers 
to gain some deeper understanding of the API instead of using these helper functions and classes that do things for me automatically. And it can also be a good source of information when we go through this header and study what is being done. And that way we can also learn a lot. So that's why I'm using this D3DX. Going back to our resources, I already selected this block of code, so I can take it out and put it in here. And as I mentioned before, there are more types of heaps and therefore there are different types of heap properties that we can create. And for now, we just have one for the default heap. And later on, we will have other kinds of heap properties here as well. So now here in resource CPP file, instead of using default heap, I can use that newly created constant data structure. So I'm going to include the header file for that. We are also getting a warning here that tells us that info.desk, which contains the description of the resource that we are trying to create, could be a null pointer. And that doesn't fit with the specification of this function, which is right. We don't check if this description is a null pointer while we are using it here. So here I'm going to check if the info description is not null. Well, I guess that helps the warning to go away. And this is pretty much all we need to do to define a texture class that contains the information that we want. As I mentioned in the intro of this video, next time I'm going to use this texture class as the resource in the render target and depth stencil textures. Thank you so much for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus, there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.